This is a mechanism of disease map for peritonsillar abscess. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of peritonsillar abscess. As in all of these flowcharts, each of the boxes is color-coded according to this legend in the top right, and I'll be clearing all of the boxes and talking through them one by one as we repopulate the flowchart. Let's go ahead and get started with peritonsillar abscess and the pathophysiology. Now the exact pathophysiology for this disease is not completely understood, and I'm going to be presenting the most accepted theory, which sounds really good, so let's get started with that. You have an infection that develops in the crypta magna. Now the tonsillar crypts are just part of normal physiology. They provide a sentry role for the immune system by allowing early exposure to infectious organisms. So it's a normal part of the tonsils. You have these crypts, these little like divots in their structure, where you allow for bacteria to get in, bacteria, viruses, other pathogens. And um, it, the idea is that you're exposing your immune system to them that way. However, the bacteria, the pathogens can grow in that space. And if they grow too much and the immune system can't contain them, that leads to this pathophysiology of a peritonsillar abscess. So when the bacteria grows too much, you have infection that spreads beyond the confines of the tonsillar capsule. This by itself can cause a peritonsillitis. This is inflammation of the space around the tonsils. And there are some symptoms that come out of this. And it'll be important to differentiate just a standard peritonsillitis or a a tonsillitis or a sore throat from an actual peritonsillar abscess. And we'll talk about the differentiating manifestations in just a second. When you have inflammation in the peritonsillar space, you'll have white blood cells that respond to this inflammation. So they come in, they uh, do what they normally do. They try to contain the inflammation, they try to contain the infection, and essentially nearby tissue dies. When that nearby tissue dies, it creates a hole that can then fill with the pathogen, the bacteria, and or pus, the remnants of the white blood cells that came in to respond to that inflammation, and that hole filled with pathogen and pus forms the abscess. So this is how you have the peritonsillar abscess. And we'll have some specific symptoms and manifestations that come from the abscess itself. And again, we'll differentiate those from peritonsillitis. Before we get into that, let's talk about the etiology. This is pretty simple. I've been hinting at it. It's largely bacteria. The most common bacteria that's found in peritonsillar abscess is Streptococcus pyogenes. So S. pyogenes is the most common. It'll be bold here for that reason. There are other bacteria that play a role as well. There's Streptococcus anginosus, Viridians streptococcus, Staph aureus, and Haemophilus species. And in general, you usually have a mix of these bacteria with others that we haven't listed here. So it's often a polymicrobial environment. You're at highest risk when you're an adult aged 20 to 40 years old, and it can also come from other infections inside your mouth. So you can have an acute bacterial tonsillitis that then kind of spreads to the potential space between the tonsils and the pharyngeal muscles and then develops in the cryptomagna and goes down that pathophysiology. So uh, most common bacteria is Streptococcus pyogenes and it can spread from other things as well. Most common in adults age 20 to 40, but it also happens in kids and adolescents as well. Now let's get into the manifestations. So these are the manifestations that come from tonsillitis and peritonsillitis. So you can have fever, malaise, a severe sore throat, dysphagia, and odynophagia. This is um, difficulty swallowing and pain with swallowing. And these, I mentioned, were also symptoms of tonsillitis, so they're not exactly specific for peritonsillar abscess. These are a little more specific for peritonsillar abscess. You can have a hot potato voice, which is just a weird classic way of saying muffled speech. You can also have drooling and halitosis. Halitosis means bad breath. And it makes sense that you have bad breath. You have essentially bacteria growing inside this hole inside your mouth. So bacteria smells horrible, it's gonna make your breath smell horrible. It also kind of messes up your swallowing, and if you have pain with swallowing, it makes sense that you'll have drooling as well. So it's all inflamed down there, it's infected down there, you're gonna have drooling and bad breath. Another characteristic symptom of peritonsillar abscess is tonic spasms of the jaw musculature. So because you have this infection, this inflammation, your jaw musculature is going to be constantly spasming. It's going to be harder to open your mouth. This is called trismus. It's also common in tetanus infections as well. But the point is that this is less common in tonsillitis. So this is more specific to the peritonsillar abscess. So hot potato voice, drooling, halitosis, and trismus with something in the back of the throat should make you think peritonsillar abscess. 
some things you might notice on physical exam. The patient, uh, because they have this, as this abscess and this abscess does take up space, they might have a deviation of the uvula to the contralateral side. The uvula is the little dangly thing in the back of your throat, and that's going to be pointed away from the peritonsillar abscess. And that's just the result of mass effect. The abscess itself takes up space, pushes the uvula over to the other side. They'll also have inferior and medial displacement of the tonsil if the peritonsillar abscess is quite large. You might be able to see the abscess itself. It'll look like a unilateral fluctuant swollen erythematous tonsil with exudates, and that can also cause bulging of the palatine arch on the same side. In addition, they can have ipsilateral ear pain, they can have ipsilateral cervical lymphadenopathy on your exam, and if the inflammation is really bad, you might see the neck swelling from the outside as well without even looking at their throat. Next, a few things that cause that are resultant of this, uh, just complications that result from peritonsillar abscess. First and most seriously is airway compromise. If this thing gets really big, again, there's mass effect, it can close their airway and prevent them from breathing. This is the most dangerous and the most lethal complication. They can also have internal jugular vein thromboses and thrombophlebitis from the surrounding inflammation. And there are several complications that result from rupture of the abscess. Remember, the body's gonna try to wall off this hole filled with pathogen and pus, but if the bacteria grows too much, it's too high pressure and it ruptures, you can have other complications. Firstly, the infection can spread, of course, if the abscess ruptures. You can have infection of the peripharyngeal space, infection of the retropharyngeal space. If the rupture gets into the mediastinum, you can have mediastinitis. If the rupture gets into the fascia, you can have necrotizing fasciitis. You can also have a rupture that gets into the bloodstream that could lead to bacteremia, which can then lead to sepsis. The rupture can also get into the airway. This can cause aspiration pneumonia, which can even further um, compromise your airway. And remember, airway is the most lethal outcome of peritonsillar abscess, so it's something you want to look out for in a patient that has this. Lastly, a quick word on how to diagnose this. It's largely a clinical diagnosis. You can do your standard tests for strep. You might want to do a mono test as well to rule that as well. Um, but uh, largely it's a clinical diagnosis. If you do a CT scan with contrast, you will be able to see the abscess if it's large. It'll look like a hypodense lesion in the narrow pharynx. But that CT with contrast is not always necessary for the diagnosis. This has been a flowchart for peritonsillar abscess. I hope it was helpful, and thank you for listening.